This fly is Orky, O-R-C-K-Y. It's patterned after the famous blind crayfish of the Appalachians and the Ozarks. In building this fly, uh, some of the morphology or anatomy of the crayfish is exaggerated because exaggeration adds flexibility, adds attractiveness to the fly. And uh, as a result, uh, it's a better fly. It's the only crayfish pattern that I know of that looks and behaves like a crayfish. And it's a simple pattern to tie. Whereas most fly fishermen tie crayfish, the first failing of, um, I think, most crayfish imitations is they're far too complex. The simpler the fly can be, the better it is. So given that as a, a prelude to this fly, we'll tie one. Like so many of my flies, the basics are all the same. So when I learn one technique, then I can use and apply that technique to as many flies as I can dream up or have nightmares about. <laughs> And believe you me, um, some of my flies, <laughs> people think I must be a, a ghoul. Put in two beads of thread. Unlike eyes in flies, which are bright, uh, I use dark colored, lead weighted weights. These lead eyes are real broad in axes, so they have to be adjusted in the corner of the jig hook. Okay, I think that's, that will do all right. What makes a crayfish unique is that it walks along and uh, it slips up on its food. It's got big pincers or a chelicery, and it grabs its food and disarticulates most of its dead material that it eats. When it escapes, it shoots backwards. So these, what might be construed as eyes, are really a weight on the tail. And the darkness of the, the weight causes one's eyes not to focus on the wrong end of the fly. Bright eyes, dazzle eyes, and so forth are designed to focus attention of the would-be eater on the head of the fly. One thing about tying crayfish that's great. There's no wrong way to tie a crayfish because crayfish are always beat up. They lose a uh, chelicery, they lose a leg, they might lose an eye, they might lose an antenna, they have them of different sizes. So <laughs> you can use junk materials to tie this fly. And that's what I'm doing here. So I don't worry about symmetry in the fly. I don't worry about uh, whether something's got a kink in it or a bend in it that shouldn't be there because all crayfish have exactly what I put into this fly. One antenna and another antenna. What I've done is pull all the barbs off the shaft of the feather. This is just ordinary garden variety chicken feather. It's got a little dyed brown in this one. Okay, let's see. Here's the first antenna. Clip off this. Clip off that bit of extra. The way this fly is setting up, the antennae are going to be 
on either side of the point of the hook. And in many instances, the antennae will act like wind guards. That's always beneficial. We got one long antenna sticking up there. Well, here's the other one. Oh, here's the other one. And one antenna there. Pull them down just a little bit. Most fly fishermen would clip these extra long pieces off, but uh, I don't like to do that. So what I do is I gently fold them up against the shaft of the hook. Making sure that one part of the shaft goes down each side of the hook and then wrap them in good and tight. Oops. Come on. Stay put. You see the hook is getting flat now on the side. I'll take these pieces and I'll fold them back. And bind them in. Now, you see there's a flat surface there as opposed to a round shaft surface. So it makes it easier to wrap later on and put the pincers in. Clip off these little extra pieces here. The pincers. Let's get some nice brown here. There's one nice pincer, or chelicera. You want to be an aficionado of invertebrate nomenclature. How about that? <laughs> I entertain myself quite a bit. Okay, another pincer. You take the pincer, lock it in. Oops, Let me move up a little bit further. Okay, and here's another one. A lot of leave these white things sticking out there. They're kind of neat, but then that would destroy the reality of the crayfish. Okay. A little fine adjustment. Wrap those little shafts in. Since this is the age of the green conservation effort, we want to save as much of this, use as much of this feather as possible. Crayfish come in all colors. Most are brown, brown green, or brown black, or brown brown. So you know I have a variety of color in this one. The escape locomotor of a crayfish, commonly called a tail, 
technically, it's called Telson, T-E-L-S-O-N. And it's built with five plates, sometimes called scutes. Well, one thing about fishing that's so great, fish can't count. <laughs> so uh, when I make a Telson, I only put three scutes in it. And I've caught crayfish in my life that have parts of the tail chewed off and whatnot. So I'm at least within morphological reasonability to make three scoots in the Telson. Does that make sense? Trim those down a little more, but this is partridge skin. And partridge banny chickens and so forth, most of them are brown or brown gray. And any of the flank and rump feathers make good parts for Telsons. The fly is upside down. So I have to remember that when I put these scutes on, I want them to be upside down so when the fly turns over right, the tail looks correct. Uh, put the first telson in place. There you go, They're nice and square. That's going to be all right. Outside scute. Ooh, don't do that. Okay, on the inside, it's good. The nice thing about playing with these scutes is that you can, they can be bulldozed a little bit. And once they're bulldozed, a little drop of encouragement will keep them in one place. Leslie. And by the time get to the end of the fly, that liquid encouragement will be stiff enough that the tail should flatten out. Got some good green here. Get a little green and gray with black stripes on it. Make it look like a NASCAR. And I like copper crystal flash. Here in the mountains, brass color in any kind of a fly will catch more fish, but if a little bit of copper is added to the fly, it has a tendency to bring the fishermen bigger fish. So I like the copper and the crayfish.
Whoops. What happened here? Got a backlash in the copper. There we go. Let's just fix that. How's that? That's a pretty good recovery. Now this part of, of the system is great. So if, if I didn't have the capacity to raise the vise, then I'd be dealing with a long rope out here. But by raising the vise up, then I'm working with a sh more free space and I'm not having to drag the rope or the bobbin or anything on the floor. So I went two times behind each, or in front of, in this case, each pincer. Now go down to the antenna. Oop, wrong antennae. In front of the antennae. Two times. Back once more in front of the antennae. Lock them in place. Two times in front of the pincers. Two times behind the pincers. And back down the body. Half pitch it off. Lower the system. Trim these little extra pieces off. It's tough to get over because I can't see. Now I gotta do some cosmetic work here. First thing I wanna do is take these big pieces off of the antennae. But I wanna leave a little paddle. Oh, I'm gonna go up that way. So the little pads that are sticking out there, those catch the slightest current and cause the antennae to move. I didn't do that, then the antennae would be stiff and they wouldn't, wouldn't flex in the slightest motion of the water. Twist the chelicery around, pincers. See, the pincers are different sizes. Uh, to make this creature stand up in a defensive posture, I have a pair of long scissors here. 
and the barbs on the underside of the body here, if I bevel them back toward the telson thusly. Should make the crayfish stand up in a defensive posture. Let's see if it does. There he goes. Yeah, he's standing up like he should. Defensive. Antennae up, chelicerae out. But these are flexible enough that when strip the fly and it zips backwards, the chelicerae hang fold down and the antennae fold down. The animal goes up off the bottom, and then it settles down. It always settles down Telson first. That's why that weight is back there. Bola. Orchid.